Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, sorry, is this working? Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's um, professional lunch here at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. I'm Anthony Rowley. Uh, first vice president of the club. Uh, before we start, can I uh, remind you as usual, please, if you have a mobile phone, to switch it off or put it onto silent mode as a courtesy to our, our guest. Well, it's my pleasure today to introduce um, today's speaker, who is Paul Sheard, um, executive vice president and chief economist at the financial and commodity market intelligence group, S&P Global. Uh, he's here today to let us have his views on the outlook for the global economy as a whole. Uh, he'll uh, certainly be mentioning Trumponomics and Brexit and other um, uh, um, critical issues of that kind. Um, Paul has spoken here on many occasions, so it's hardly necessary to, for me to introduce him. Um, I could just say he's a world-renowned economist who can speak with authority on just about any economic subject under the sun. Um, but that would be rather lazy on my part, so I'd better say a little bit more. Um, he is, as I said, Executive Vice President and Chief Economist of S&P Global, in which role he spearheads the company's economic and market analysis. He also chairs the Standard & Poor's Academic Council and helps to oversee the S&P Global Institute. Previously to that, Dr. Sheard held the positions of Chief Economist at the Nomura Securities in New York and at Lehman Brothers in Tokyo. And prior to that, he had been Head of Japan Equity Investments and Japan Strategist at Bering um, Asset Management here in Tokyo. Uh, he was a member uh, of the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council on the International Monetary System between 2010 and 2012. Um, so uh, I think as we are fairly tight on space today, time today, I'm not going to say any more. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sherd back to the club. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, that kind introduction, uh, Anthony. The, the, the podium usually appears by magic. Um, I've always been quite impressed by uh, how that happens, but uh, it, uh, today was the exception that proved the rule. So um, again, great pleasure to be back here at, uh, at this illustrious club. Uh, it's a, it's uh, always a, an honor and a pleasure to be able to share my thoughts. So um, you know, I always like to talk about kind of the issues of the day and a little bit about Japan. So I thought uh, I would start with some observations on uh, Trumponomics and the Trump administration and maybe talk a little bit about Brexit, how that's developing and uh, the key issues to be thinking about there. Uh, and then maybe finish with uh, some comments on uh, where the Bank of Japan is at uh, with its uh, QQE with yield curve control and uh, as part of the whole Ab Abenomics project. So let me start with, um, with Mr. Uh, Trump uh, and the Trump administration. And I have to say, um, you know, it, it never ceases to be fun for an economist covering the global economy. I spent many years in Japan, and of course, uh, Japan was a laboratory of interesting economic issues. And now, of course, we have a very interesting uh, administration in the U.S. So the U.S. has kind of come to the top of the uh, the inbox. Uh, and I have to say, as an economist uh, trying to sort of follow uh, the U.S. economy and try and sort of forecast where it might be going, it is quite fascinating because uh, President Trump, of course, is a is a very unlikely president. Uh, uh, nobody kind of expected him to be president, certainly if you went back six months or a year, but even uh, in November, up till November 8th, uh, I think it was uh, the, everybody was expecting a Clinton administration. And uh, But President Trump is not somebody that has had really any uh, policy-making experience. He's not somebody who's been steeped in uh, economic policy-making over his career. And, and, and yet he has, of course, a lot of uh, interesting uh, 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 views and policies that are coming out and tweets and everything else. So what I try to do as an economist is sort of try to listen to the president and, and the administration and sort of map that into an economic model and try to translate it into a framework that I can kind of understand as an economist and then try to figure out, does it make sense? Where's it going? Etc. Um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of material to uh, to work with here. Uh, just looking at the dif different elements of the um, Trump administration policy, in some ways it has a little bit of. Um, 
kind of uh, similarity in some ways uh, to Abenomics. If you think of Abenomics, is essentially some you know, supply-side policies and macroeconomic policies. I mean, economics and economic policy making is not that complicated. It usually boils down to uh, what do you do on the supply side of the economy to try to lift <coughs> potential growth, to drive innovation, uh, and then what do you do on the demand side of the economy with your macroeconomic policy tools, monetary policy and fiscal policy, uh, maybe financial system policy, to try to make sure that the economy is uh, actually generating an, enough demand to keep, uh, to essentially uh, keep uh, the economy at its supply potential and at full employment. So um, it's not a, no surprise that if you look at uh, uh, Trumponomics, you see, first of all, a, a big focus on deregulation, uh, winding back uh, regulation. Now, in, in, in Japan, of course, Japan has a long and illustrious history of talking about deregulation and structural reform. It's just almost part of the national narrative. You go back to the 1980s with the Maikawa report uh, in the 90s. 1990s, of course, long forgotten was Prime Minister Hosokawa, and there was a big push with deregulation, and then there was the Hiraiwa report. Then you go to uh, Hashimoto administration, uh, the big six reform program, you know, Koizumi, and now we have Abenomics. So the idea that uh, the governments need to really focus on deregulation, uh, f taking the shackles off the business community, and unleashing animal spirits and productivity, um, you know, very long history in, in, in Japan. That kind of debate is not really, you don't see it as much in the US um, as a kind of overriding narrative for, uh, for, for the federal government's policy. But that's certainly been a big theme from, from Mr. Trump. And it's something that he you know, can make a fair amount of progress with through executive orders. So there have been a lot of executive orders coming out of the, the White House. And a lot of them take the form of essentially instructions to the different uh, cabinet secretaries and, and ministries, departments, to review their policies and to, where possible, uh, wind back on excessive regulation. So we've seen developments around the energy sector. Uh, we're seeing it in uh, financial regulation. Doesn't mean that Dodd-Frank is going to go out the window, but certainly the pendulum is being brought back uh, from perhaps what was seen as, as sort of over-regulation. Uh, you see it in obviously health care. Um, that's not just a deregulation issue, but is also a more of a social contract issue as well. Um, but you see it uh, in uh, in those areas. And also just the whole idea that this narrative is really there now that you know American business, not just um, big business, but also small and medium enterprises are kind of um, uh, being, you know, operating and being crushed by all this regulation. Now, I'm not exactly sure how accurate a portrayal of underlying reality it is, but it certainly is a strong narrative and is leading to um, a, a major deregulation push. Um, another big uh, thrust, of course, of Trumponomics is uh, tax cuts and tax reform. Now. Tax cuts and tax reform are really two different things. Tax cuts, um, although they're kind of related, obviously, but tax cuts we normally think perhaps more as having a, a stimulatory effect on demand. Uh, and tax reform is really more about changing the tax system more permanently to make it more efficient uh, and, uh, and fit for purpose. So both of those uh, objectives seem to be there. Uh, so it's a mixture, if you like, of aggregate demand support and also sort of uh, tax reform which is aimed at unleashing animal spirits, uh, driving more investment in the economy uh, and, and lifting uh, real potential growth again. And I'll come back to that uh, issue of potential growth in a moment. Uh, a third major uh, pillar of, of Trumponomics, if you like, of course, is the uh, infrastructure uh, plan, the idea that was floated in the campaign of a trillion dollar uh, infrastructure program over 10 years. Now just to sort of you know, benchmark that, that would be equivalent to maybe a little bit less than half a percentage point of growth per year if you actually got a trillion dollar infrastructure uh, uh, stimulus on top of um, the existing infrastructure spending that is, is in the pipeline anyway. Um, and that's, of course, an open question as well. We're very familiar with these arguments from Japan that when plans are announced, sometimes they may just be kind of cobbling together some of the existing plans and it's not necessarily as big a net addition to demand as, as, may, be, uh, as may appear. Um, but when it comes to both the tax reforms uh, and also um, uh, the infrastructure plans, 
they're still very early in terms of, you know, still plans being debated in the Congress, um, and it's still going to be some time before these plans actually uh, are, are really ready to, uh, you know, to be uh, voted on. And, and come to the president's desk. So we're not really factoring in very much by way of stimulus to growth. This year, maybe it's more of a 2018 story. So deregulation, uh, that's supply side reforms, infrastructure spending, tax cuts, that's sort of you know, fiscal stimulus, uh, and um, uh, the tax reforms. They're all things that market participants and economists would typically probably applaud. There are a couple of other elements where people are perhaps uh, a little bit more sanguine and see some downside risk factors. Uh, one of them is around Im immigration and sort of building the wall and, uh, uh, and whatnot. Um, now, again, it's not for me to tell either the Japanese or the Americans what sort of immigration policy they should have, since I hold a passport in neither countries. Um, but I think what you can observe with some degree of objectivity is that the immigration system in the US is broken. Uh, and that's really, I think, the premise on which public policy needs to be based. And it's kind of broken in two senses. One is that there has been a lot of um, undocumented workers uh, over the last uh, couple of decades coming into the US. So, you know, security of the border is an issue. Uh, and so the idea that you might want to secure the border, um, you know, is not something that in and of itself is, is all that shocking. And say, well, that's really what any sovereign nation uh, should be uh, able to do or want to do. Um, but it's also the, the legal immigration system that is really bottlenecked up. Um, and if you know, if you're living in the U.S. and uh, you want to continue to, to work there and maybe get a green card, um, you know, it's pretty difficult. And uh, you know, the line can be very, very long in some cases, maybe even up to 10 years, um, unless you are really supported by a company uh, and there's a particular job that is waiting for you. So um, you know, the land of immigration, the U.S., you know, has really got to a point where uh, that. Uh, you know, driver of dynamism and, 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 and growth over many decades uh, is being called into question. So we'll have to wait and see how immigration policy pans out. But in principle, um, it may not be a bad thing. But if it led to a much more exclusionary bias, then that, that maybe uh, will have some economic consequences. Um, the, la the last area, of course, I, I want to touch on is, tr is trade. And uh, again, that was a big issue in the election and the presidential campaign. And one of the few promises that Mr. Trump acted on pretty much immediately, literally the first day in office, was to withdraw from TPP, uh, which was, um, again, something that he campaigned pretty strongly on. But not everything that he cam campaigned on did he you know, immediately move to uh, implement. So it does appear that Mr. Trump feels quite strongly about these trade issues. Um, and, you know, the mantra there, the sort of political uh, slogan is, yes, we support free trade, but, but free trade needs to be fair. So it's this idea of free but fair trade. And what does fair trade mean? It's really this idea of uh, trade deals being reciprocal, that if the U.S. is opening its market to... China or Japan or Mexico or whoever, um, then it wants to make sure that there is reciprocal access. Now that sounds like it's a sensible kind of idea, but that's not really actually the basis on which the international uh, trading system has been based in the past. Um, there are principles of most favored nation treatment that you shouldn't discriminate against other countries in terms of access to your domestic market. But you know, trade deals are all about trying to kind of trade different uh, different different aspects of access to markets uh, to get mutual benefits, but they're not necessarily based on the idea of complete reciprocity. Part of the reason for that is that countries have different comparative advantages, they have different structures of their economy, they, diff they have different stages of economic development. So it doesn't always make sense to say, okay, we're going to give you X, Y, and Z, and you have to give us the exact same X, Y, and Z. Um, but that's kind of the mantra that's coming from the, uh, the Trump administration. The other thing which is notable around trade is uh, this uh, preference for doing bilateral trade deals rather than operating in a multilateral framework. And that seems to be one of the reasons that uh, the administration was so um, quick to throw TPP under the bus, 
by the way, I think that it may emerge from under that bus at some point, um, but for the time being, of course, it's not really going anywhere as far as the US participation is involved. Um, but the thinking there, listening to um, Trump administration officials, seems to be this idea that, well, why would you want to do multilateral trade deals? Bilateral, a series of bilateral trade deals would be better because when you do bilateral trade deals, now this is them speaking, not me, by the way. I'm not advocating this uh, as a card-carrying economist. But the, the logic is to say, well, it, we've, we start with country A and we might want to get certain access to that market and we'll give some concessions in return. But then we turn to country B, we might want to get a, a different uh, set of concessions from that company, uh, from that country, and we're maybe prepared to tailor some concessions on our part to them as well. But we don't want to give the same concessions to them that we gave to country A. So as you go down the list, A, B, C, D, E, you might want to cut very specific bespoke deals with each one. Um, and I think also they probably have the idea that if the US is still pretty much the largest economy in the world and the biggest market for, uh, you know, of a, which is attractive to other countries, if you do it one by one, you maximize your leverage against each of those small partners. You do it in a multilateral framework, uh, then you're just one of 12 in the TPP, for example. Um, 12 or 13, whatever the number is, uh, and uh, you know, potentially everybody else can gang up on you. So again, Mr. Trump is very much the, the sort of the art of the deal man and approaches these uh, trade issues from the viewpoint of really sort of, you know, how do you drive the toughest bargain? And there seems to be a, a bit of a zero-sum game kind of mentality here as well, that when you do these trade deals, you're kind of, um, you know, you want something and, and so you're prepared to give something up in return, but you don't really want to give it up, but you need to give it up to get the other thing that you want access to the beef market or whatever it might, it might be. So there's this kind of like zero-sum game mentality, whereas I think when people think about trade deals uh, uh, in a multilateral context, the idea is that, you know, everybody is happy to commit to open their markets, and the more countries that you have involved in that, the more likely you are to generate positive sum games and um, you know, lift all the boats. So I think there's a different kind of mentality at work there. So I think in terms of the market perspective, the markets like the deregulation thrust, they like the infrastructure idea, uh, they like the idea of unleashing animal spirits, they like tax reform, tax cuts, all of this stuff is music to the market's ears, um, but they're a little bit more cautious about where the immigration debate potentially could end up, and also particularly, most notably, probably around trade. But I think the, the pre prevalent view at the moment is, um, yes, there's a lot of rhetoric there, but surely um, the, the US will not be silly enough to go down the sort of smooth hawley 1930s route of all-out trade wars. But there's a risk here because if you're saying to your trading partners, unless you open your market to us the way that we open to you, you know, then we're going to close our market to you. If that's the threat point, if that's the leverage, and it turns out that you don't extract the concession that you're looking for, well, what's next? Do you make good on your threat to lift tariffs and, and other barriers? And if you start doing that on a bilateral basis, um, suddenly you do descend into a trade war territory. So um, there are some, some definite downside risks here. Um, let me touch on a couple of other um, points, but I'm watching the clock here, so I'll speed up a little bit. Um, but I think interesting in in issues out there. Um, one is I've, I've touched on potential growth a few times. Potential growth is the rate of growth that you can expect from an economy if it's operating at full, full potential. Now, most economists would say that the potential growth rate in the US is currently around about 2% and maybe a little bit lower. If you were bullish, you might say, oh, it's a little bit more like, maybe it's two to two and a half percent. That would be, you'd be regarded as being, oh, really? How do you get to two and a half percent? But the administration has put out a number of three percent. Uh, and that basically saying 3% growth should be attainable and sustainable over the long term. Now, 
you know, maybe that's an aspirational number and it's good to sort of lift your sights and aim high. Um, but from an economic perspective, um, it does raise some questions of, well, how would you actually get to 3% growth? 3% growth would be nice, but, you know, 3% uh, growth doesn't grow on trees like money doesn't. And it, the only way to get from 2% potential growth to 3% potential growth is by uh, increasing the labor force, increasing the capital stock, or becoming permanently more productive. And if we loop back to the immigration point, the, the, the way in which um, you know, the US has managed to uh, to one of the reasons the U.S. Has, has, uh, has had such strong growth over the years is that it has had a lot of immigration. Immigration, on some reckoning, has added you know, as, up as much as one percentage point to GDP growth. So if the tide is turning on immigration as on a secular kind of basis, that's actually swimming in the wrong direction from saying, hey, we, we, want, we want to get from 2% to 3%. You know, let's embrace more immigration. That would make sense, but if it's the other direction, it just puts more onus on the two other aspects. The two other aspects being capital accumulation. Now, um, you could see the deregulation thrust, tax reform, that is all sort of pointing in the direction of wanting corporate Japan, uh, sorry, corporate the US uh, to invest more. That could lead to higher potential growth uh, in, in the longer term. But again, you know, easier said than done. Similarly for productivity. Um, there's been a lot of debate in the last few years, uh, particularly in the US but, but even elsewhere, around the productivity puzzle. That productivity growth has continued to slow and since the financial crisis has been running at around about half a percent or so. Um, and if you could take that to say one and a half percent, then you might get from 2 to 3%. That's arithmetic. But um, again, lifting productivity growth, and remember, we're not talking about a one-off shift. We're talking about a continuous increase in productivity growth year in, year out. Um, is not is not an easy thing to do. Again, the deregulation, the tax reform um, may help in that regard, um, but uh, it's it's a very very heavy lift to get that much productivity improvement. So that's just one one thing to keep an eye on there. Uh, a second issue, uh, which I think is a very of, of great interest in the markets, although uh, people are not focusing that much on it right at the moment, is what how will the Federal Reserve fit into the Trump administration's economic policy framework? Um, and uh, that's very relevant because Mr. Trump has an almost unique opportunity to put a real stamp on the Federal Reserve. Uh, there are seven uh, governors on the Federal Reserve Board of Governors that form the core of the Federal Reserve System, permanent voting members of the FOMC, and there are three vacancies at the moment, including the very important vice chairman for financial oversight position that has never really been filled. So, um, you know, if, if President Trump wanted to, he could almost immediately put three new people, including a vice chair, on the Federal uh, Reserve Board of Governors. But the big prize, of course, is the chair of the Federal Reserve, which is at the moment Janet Yellen. Well, her term comes up in February of next year. And um, most people assume that President Trump would choose to put uh, his own person in place at the top of the Federal Reserve rather than keep Janet Yellen on. Um, and that will be, again, a very big appointment. What's sort of at stake here is um, you know, the, the idea of the, the Fed remaining an independent and rather sort of uh, non-political technocratic uh, body. Um, now I think there is some room for central banks like the Fed to perhaps um, be brought a little bit closer into economic policy making of the government. Uh, in fact the Federal Reserve itself, if you look on its website, in explaining its independence says, well the Fed is not independent of the government, it's independent in the government, recognizing that monetary policy is really part of overall government policy making. So I think for a number of reasons there is some scope for the pendulum to swing back a little bit and maybe the Federal Reserve uh, can be seen as participating a little bit more in the coordination and the communication around economic policy, a little bit like it is in Japan, frankly speaking, um, with the Economic and Fiscal Policy Council, with the monthly uh, economic meeting of the cabinet, the central bank governor. Uh, turns up to those meetings, uh, so there's closer communication. That closer communication and need for closer communication and coordination is actually written into the Bank of Japan law, Article 4. Um, so I think that's not a bad framework. 
So if that's the direction of travel in the US as well, I think that would be positive. But what the markets uh, and many economists would be worried about is if um, the independence of the Fed was really usurped and the Federal Reserve chair and other board positions started to be seen very overtly as political appointees who are really doing the bidding of the president. So that's something to watch uh, going, uh, going forward in the next few months. Um, and just one final point maybe um, on sort of thinking about the coherence of the whole policy framework of Trumponomics. Does it all sort of fit together? Um, I mentioned the fact that you know, the aspiration to get to 3% growth may be a little bit, uh, bit far-fetched. Uh, good to have that aspiration, but maybe not all that realistic. But um, the other point that I would focus on is if you look at what the different elements of policy here, so one of them is to essentially lift investment, another one is to cut taxes, um, both of the, and, and another one is that Mr. Trump clearly doesn't like trade deficits. He sees trade deficits as a form of weakness and essentially as an indication that you're, um, you've lost the, the battle with your trading partners, they got the better deal, they got the upper hand. So essentially, um, you might say, well, what Trumponomics is aiming for is an increase in investment, uh, maybe cutting of taxes, and also decreasing the trade deficit and the current account deficit. The trouble with that is, if you know a little thing called the national accounting identity, which basically says that net savings in the private and public sector, that is savings minus investment equals the current account balance, um, you will see, and if you write that down and study it for a moment, you'll see that uh, unless there is a massive increase in savings in the economy, either in the household sector or the corporate sector, um, you just really can't cut the current account deficit uh, if you, at the same time you're increasing private investment and cutting taxes. Now one argument would be that the cut a supply side logic, that by cutting taxes and doing tax reform you're going to end up with more tax revenue because the economy will grow so much that it'll just pay for itself. That's the supply side logic. Um, but again, I don't think that's something that you would want to put your uh, mortgage on uh, actually coming, coming true. Now why is this important? Well, you know, it might be important in 12 months time or two years time as we move towards the midterms, one and a half years time, if it turns out that uh, with more fiscal stimulus in the economy, the Fed is actually raising interest rates at a faster rate. That's where the independence issue comes into play. The dollar is likely to be strengthening. Um, that's not going to be particularly good for exports. And if the current account deficit and the trade deficit are actually getting much bigger, that will be something that maybe Mr. Trump will say, hold on a minute, um, you know, who's to blame for that? And it probably won't be him. It may well be, you know, whoever is generating the, the, bigger, the bigger surpluses, China, Germany, Mexico, uh, Japan, whoever it is. So, you know, how that politics uh, plays out will be very uh, interesting to watch. So, um, I didn't realize I was going to spend 28 minutes on Trump. If you want to say something about Brexit, you've got a few more. Okay, so I've, I'm going to... I know that uh, Anthony's going to cut me off at my legs in a few minutes, and we're going to leave plenty of time for Q&A, but I did want to just touch very briefly on um, Brexit and, uh, and the Bank of Japan. So on Brexit, um, you know, Britain leaving the EU is a monumental act. It's a, it's a giant uh, earthquake in Europe. Um, now Article, Article 50 has been triggered in March and a two-year process of Britain negotiating with the EU to leave the EU uh, has begun. Um, the point I would really just like to kind of make here, and I think I've probably made these comments at previous uh, addresses at, in this room, is that there's a lot more going on in the EU and in the Eurozone, and they have a lot more challenges than just dealing with Brexit. Brexit is a real shock to the system. I mean, it's the second largest economy, Britain, uh, in, the, in the European Union. And, you know, in some ways it's not very nice of the Brits to pack up their tent and say, okay, we're out of here, you deal with your problems by yourself. Um, so there is a, a certain amount of wounded pride and, and a lot of disappointment. But the fundamental sort of problem or set of challenges in the European Union, which 28 to become 27 countries, and particularly with the 19 countries 
in the European Union that are in the Eurozone, that share the Euro as their common currency, uh, there are enormous challenges there which have to do with the fact that the, the Eurozone and the EU are really a kind of half-built uh, political and economic house. Fiscal union, sorry, monetary union without fiscal union doesn't really make much sense. Uh, uh, having freedom of movement of people and workers uh, and to a large extent even borderless internal uh, travel within much of the European Union, that is the Schengen zone. Schengen is not exactly the same thing as the EU, but there's a very large overlap. But not having uh, common security of the external border and not having very good internal uh, uh, security, internal intelligence sharing, internal um, uh, uh, policing policies uh, is also very problematic and we've seen that time and time again with various terrorist events uh, in, in Europe as well. So the Europeans understand this and they are engaged in a multi-year process of trying to figure out what to do with this half-built house um, and of course what they want to do is complete the house, not tear it down but you know, it could go in one or two, two directions. And Brexit is really indicating that, well, one of those, not quite the daikokobashira, but one of those pillars is being pulled out. So the, the EU has to deal not just over the next couple of years with negotiating with Britain about the, the future of the relationship, but even more importantly, trying to figure out among the EU 27 what kind of uh, political and economic entity they want to have in the future. Um, implicitly, if not explicitly, the vision has always been Europe moving gradually towards something that looks like a United States of Europe, but that requires really pooling of fundamental political sovereignty and essentially a process where national identity starts to become more like a European-wide identity. Um, and, and that process is, is still you know, very much in its, in its formative years. Now, one thing I'd just like to point out here is we have this very important set of elections this year. We've already had essentially two down, two to go. The Netherlands in March, France in uh, just a couple of uh, weeks ago, last weekend, and then of course Germany coming up in September, and then there's another one early next year, probably the Italian referendum. There's also a British, uh, sorry, the Italian election, also a British election, but that's less relevant now given Brexit. So these four important elections, two of them down, and they seem to be going sort of well in the sense of, you know, more pro-European politicians are prevailing. Um, but this is a sort of a year politically in Europe where, um, to a large extent implicitly, but to a certain extent explicitly, uh, el electorates are being asked to really vote on the future of Europe. And speaking of the future of Europe, uh, for people like myself who kind of obsess about these things, an important white paper came out uh, on the 1st of March this year that if you're interested in this topic you might want to look at, which was called a white paper on the future of, the, uh, of Europe, and particularly what would Europe look like in 2025, well after Brexit? And what was notable about this white paper, and, and the white paper didn't come out of the blue, it, there was a history of how we got to this white paper, which goes back uh, a couple of years. But anyway, um, what was notable was that for the first time the European Commission, which is sort of the government of the European Union, laid out five scenarios for the future of Europe. Um, one of them was basically just keep doing what they're doing, kind of muddling through. Another one said maybe we should focus much more on the single market and make that the cornerstone of the European Union. Another one said, well, maybe we um, focus on a few things, not just the single market, a few things, but don't try to do everything. Don't be everything to all people. A fourth one said, um, why don't we have more multi-speed Europe? That is, those countries that want to do more together, for example, maybe have a fiscal union, or maybe have a um, much more political union, let them do that without requiring that everybody jump on the same boat. Um, sort of a multi-speed or a concentric circle Europe. And the last one was, no, everybody does more together, which is the more traditional uh, premise of the European Union. So what is sort of interesting there is that if you look at a couple of those options, they're actually not that different philosophically from what Britain was asking for in trying to renegotiate, renegotiate its stance with the EU, and that ended rather badly 
But now the EU is actually having to, to think about the same issues in the context of the EU 27. So bottom line here is um, watch this space. It's slow moving. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. But the, the next two years is not just about Brexit. It's also about the fundamental future uh, of the EU. Um, Bank of Japan. Five minutes on the Bank of Japan. Well. Anybody who's heard me speak here before in the last you know, three or four years will know that um, I'm, I'm a big supporter of what the Bank of Japan has been doing. Um, as somebody who for years had criticized the Bank of Japan for not um, being aggressive enough both with its communication and with its policy action um, to, to end deflation and to try to secure a 2% inflation, um, I think what the Bank of Japan has been doing under Governor Kuroda is exactly what they need to be doing. Um, so I'm very supportive of, of what's been going on. Um, but I've also always said that it, it would, while in principle it's kind of theoretically quite possible uh, and you know, absolutely no reason why you can't take an economy like Japan's economy from say minus 1% inflation and bring it to 2% inflation and keep it there, that's theoretically possible. It would be an extremely heavy lift. It would be very, very difficult. And fundamentally, because um, when you're in deflation like Japan was in for the best part of 20 years, essentially the whole sort of equilibrium of the economy is organized around the presumption of continuing mild deflation. And what you're trying to do in going to 2% inflation is not just change some numbers on a chart, but change the whole fundamental configuration of the economy, what economists would say is the equilibrium of the economy, and, it, and it, it's essentially like a giant coordination game. Everybody has to essentially, let's say this is the deflation room, and next door there's a big 2% inflation room. It's kind of like, look, we all want to get out of our seats and go next door and sit down in that room, but you know, we all like to be together. So who's going to go first? It, if, if somehow everybody can be coordinated to get up and move at the same time, that would be wonderful. But the world doesn't work like that. And essentially, it, it takes a person at a time and somebody getting it and saying, yeah, I know in, you know, in half an hour the room will be filled. Full. I'm going to get there first and get the first seat. Um, the reason it's not so easy is that well, the, 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 the theory that Mr. Kuroda was working on when he originally said, well, we should be able to do this more or less in two years or so, that was really highly ambitious, is because the theory would say, well, if the central bank announces a 2% inflation target, and if it's credible, then you know, all of corporate Japan uh, in their wage negotiations will say, well, we're going to have 2% inflation in future. We should build 2% inflation into our wage settlements. That has no effect on real wages, You're just lifting both by 2%. And of course, if wages go up by 2% because everybody expects 2% inflation, suddenly you get 2% inflation and you get a self-reinforcing effect. But the problem has been that nobody really believes the Bank of Japan when it says 2% inflation in two years' time, and so those wage settlements have not really moved in the right direction. Now, I come to Japan every six months or so. What is really striking me on this trip is everybody is talking about labor shortages and the tight labor market. Um, it sort of reminds me of the late 1980s uh, in, in Japan where labor shortage was the big, the big issue. Uh, unemployment rate is now 2.8%. That's the lowest unemployment rate uh, for about 23 years. The job offers to applicants ratio, a measure of labor market tightness, is at its highest level uh, in something like 25 or 26 years. And as long as growth, it continues to be above Japan's potential, and we think it will, uh, maybe one to one and a half percent zone for the next year or two. Potential growth is probably half a percent to 0 0.7 or 8 percent. So as long as growth is above potential, uh, potential, the labor market will continue to tighten. And with two things, with the Bank of Japan continuing a very aggressive monetary policy stance with QQE, with yield curve control, and maybe in the Q&A we can go into that in more detail, but it's quite innovative and, and quite aggressive. Um, and as long as the government doesn't do what it has a tendency to do, which is to put the fiscal brakes on prematurely under the uh, mantra of fiscal consolidation. And the second round of the consumption tax is not scheduled until October 2019, so there's still 
two and a quarter or so years. Uh, there is a pretty good runway here with the tightening of the labour market for Japan actually to, um, to achieve that 2% uh, target, or at least get very much on the way to doing it. So I'm a little bit more optimistic and constructive uh, on the outlook uh, for the reflation side of the Japanese economy uh, than I've been in the past. And you know, when it comes to real growth, of course, the demographics are a big headwind here. But um, every time I come back to Japan, I'm just reminded again of the incredible social capital and the infrastructure, uh, social capital being just the way the society works, the quality of life. Um, so you know, I, I don't think we have, uh, with all the other problems going on in the world, I think we can be actually um, a little bit uh, more optimistic about Japan's uh, economic, social, and political future. So I'll leave it there and uh, look forward to questions. Anthony. Thank you very much. Um, would you like to sit down? It's more. Oh, more yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll disappear from view if I do it too early. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we should, I forgot to uh, lead off the round of applause for Dr. Shirt. So let's do that now. Thank you very much indeed. Very lucid and uh, incisive as usual. Uh, I'm sorry I had to put pressure on you, but um, time goes quickly when, when, you're, when you're enjoying yourself, as they say. Um, OK, questions now from the working press first. Um, if I may, I would like to ask you a question myself very quickly. And that, that is, can we believe in the economic, global economic upturn that we seem to be seeing? You, you've just come from the ADB meeting, annual meeting and the Institute of International Finance meeting, you were on panels and so on, but you know, until very recently we were being told that uh, the global economy is, is, has been growing too slowly for too long, too low, too long for too, too, lo too slow for too long, trade, world trade was very sluggish, um, productivity was falling, demographics were all wrong, so it seemed that everything was really rather gloomy. And then suddenly around the end of last year, certainly uh, the IMF, the World Bank, the OECD and so on, all started becoming rather optimistic. And so the question is rather simply, mm. can we believe in this? Is it really an upturn or is there something <laughs> wrong there? Um, well, you know, as a, as a base, thank you, Anthony. Um, as a base case scenario, I mean, I, I think you can. Um, I think probably some of that uh, that sort of doom and gloom that you reflected in the premise of your question probably was a little bit overdone. Certainly, 2016 was a weak year uh, for global growth. That was largely because the U.S. grew at about 1.6 percent. Um, you know, which was to a large extent driven by a you know, one-week quarter. And so sort of what you tend to get sometimes, particularly in the US lately, we had it again with the first quarter this year, is you know, occasionally economies sort of take a bit of a pause for a quarter, but it's not, the, it's not presaging a downturn, which would be worrying. It's just kind of somehow a bit of a pause, and that stronger growth uh, reasserts itself. So that seems to be the picture in the US. Um, I, I would not be in the camp of saying that uh, cycles, recoveries die of old age. Um, that's not just because I'm an Australian and we're having actually a quarter of a century continuous expansion. Um, but you know, the the the, the default position for the economy is that policymakers, central banks, governments should be managing the economy to grow in line with potential growth. And having a recession is not you know, our fate in life. It's usually the result of some kind of policy error. Um, and so, uh, you know, as long as we don't get major policy errors, uh, you know, I don't think there's any particular reason to think, for example, the U.S., uh, which is the, the, you know, obviously a, a critical economy, would go down. Um, we talked about Europe before and the, the structural issues, the challenges that Europe have, um, but partly because of those challenges, um, the ECB finally sort of got on the project in uh, second half of 2014, early uh, 2015, and launched their own very aggressive monetary policy program. Uh, not just negative interest rates, but their own form of quantitative easing. So the, and that's, that's, in, that's in full flight at the moment. And so you've got, essentially, with a delay of about you know, five or six years, now the ECB behaving like the Fed was behaving you know, six or seven years ago. Um, and that provides a tailwind to demand. It's helping for the financial markets. And so we're seeing in Europe growth of you know, around about 1.5%. So that's, you know, that's going well. And the ECB is not going to be you know, turning off uh, the, the spigots uh, anytime soon. The other big economy, of course, I didn't talk about today, uh, of course, is China. Um, and you know, so far, so good touch wood, 
Um, growth is, is running pretty much in line with the government's target, actually a little bit above. Cut the target now is 6.5% growth. First quarter was 6.9. Um, and, you know, so China does seem to be uh, engineering a soft landing, a so-called soft landing. There are things to worry about in the Chinese economy, the build-up of debt, um, the fact that credit continues to grow uh, substantially above nominal GDP growth. Um, it's still a credit-intensive and investment-intensive economy. There are pockets of strong consumption, but it's not really widespread. But the Chinese government has a lot of uh, resources. It has a lot of um, it has a track record of keeping the economy on an even keel. And one thing to realize about China is, like Japan, it's been running a current account surplus for probably decades now, uh, which means that China is a net lender to the rest of the world. So if China has internal debt problems, uh, that debt push come to shove can actually be fairly easily absorbed uh, with, by the government taking some of it onto its own balance sheet. So um, if you do get problems really of a financial nature starting to come to the fore in China, um, they probably have the wherewithal to deal with them. So we're not, mm. we're not sort of you know, panicking about China. The other economy, perhaps not, not to leave out, of course, is one that doesn't get talked about as much, which is India. And uh, you know, India for the last uh, couple of years has been growing at a faster rate than China. It's you know, 15, 20 years behind, in, at least, in the economic development race. Um, but there's a lot, as you know, Anthony, from being at the ADB meetings and other meetings that you attend, a lot of good things going uh, in, on in India under the Modi government. Yes, they have a lot of challenges but um, they're doing a lot on the structural reform side of the economy. And as long as that reform momentum continues, um, there is a tremendous thirst you know, for growth in, in, and for economic development in India. And that could be you know, a very long-term, sustained, uh, positive story for the global economy. So we can believe in it. All right, uh, questions from the working press. If there aren't any questions from the working press, let's take questions from anyone who cares to ask a question. No questions? Well, <laughs> well let me, if I may, ask one, one more question. That is um, debt, mm. the, the growing levels of global debt, particularly in the emerging economies and especially in the corporate sector. A lot of voices are voicing concern over this now, including Mr. Corroda, who spoke here this week on this. I mean, this, how serious a problem could this be? I mean, as interest rates rise, as the Fed and others taper their asset purchases and so on, is it, are we looking at another debt crisis, possibly? Mm. Um, yes, so I think there is there is a build-up of debt. The IMF, as you said, has been talking about this for a couple of years now. I mean, certainly our, um, our ratings analysts within S&P Global Ratings um, are monitoring, monitoring the situation quite closely. And the, the kind of risk is that there is a lot of um, dollar-denominated uh, corporate debt in emerging markets. And, you know, if with Trumponomics, uh, the, what we end up with is a much, uh, much higher interest rates. And, you know, the, the Federal Reserve made three interest rate hikes, so it's now the federal funds rate is 75 basis points to 1%. That's still very low, but um, they're basically indicating that probably another two rate hikes in the, in the second half of this year. Um, again, they're not they're not, they're not pre-committing to this, but they're kind of indicating that they're on the right trajectory for another three interest rate hikes next year and another three interest rate hikes in 2019. So that would take the federal funds rate to around about 3%. And, you know, Japan is probably still going to be stuck close to zero and, um, you know, the, the Eurozone um, probably close, you know, maybe a little bit higher than zero, but still very, very low. So, you know, the U.S. is, is ahead of the pack. And you know, rising interest rates, you could have a much stronger dollar, and uh, you know, capital flows, if you like, coming back into the U.S. Kind of ending a period, a secular period, where the kind of only game in the global economy was emerging markets, and that's why liquidity conditions were very, very, uh, very ample. So yes, it there, there, there does look to be some stresses uh, in emerging market space, but. Uh, we don't think it's necessarily, you know, highly systemic and of a magnitude that we've seen uh, in previous occasions, take the Asia, um, mm -hmm. 
crisis back in 1997, for example. Um, and you know, part of the reason is that macroeconomic policy frameworks in large parts of the world, Asia in particular, um, are much stronger. Uh, so there have been a lot of improvements. People have seen this movie before and have made preparations for it. And you know, the leading emerging market economies, that is China and India, are not, you know, China has its debt problems, but as I said, they're pretty internally um, manageable. So, you know, when we look around, you do see economies like, you know, Turkey, South Africa, economies in uh, Latin America, um, you know, obviously Venezuela is a problem economy at the moment, but, you know, Argentina, um, Peru, Chile, some of these economies, Colombia, which m may face problems, but none of those economies, you know, with all due respect, well, Turkey maybe is a little bit different, but really rise to the level of causing, you know, major sort of systemic issues for the global economy. Hmm. Yes, that's good. Identify yourself, please, uh, as usual. My name is Kurt Sieber. I'm an associate member. Uh, thank you very much for your very interesting speech. I have two points I would like to raise. The first is about inflation. Um, the, the famous 2% line uh, was, according to my best knowledge, was at the start uh, a reduction target when um, inflation was running at 5%, 6%. So uh, banks increased the interest rates and the um, price or the inflation was supposed to go down, and it did. Uh, now, you cannot automatically assume that if you do the opposite, that if you go down and down, like we in Switzerland, even with the minus interest, uh, that automatically the result is that the uh, inflation is going up. So uh, that's my first question. Could you please comment on that first? Uh, yes, with great pleasure. Thank you. That's a very, uh, very important and uh, insightful uh, uh, observation there. Um, yes, there is a there is an asymmetry in uh, in in the. In the ability to achieve the inflation target. And until really the financial crisis, well, until Japan of the 1990s, and then more recently globally uh, with the financial crisis and the Great Recession in 2008, 2009, um, predominantly, you know, the, the challenge was to bring high inflation down to 2%. And so inflation targeting regimes were kind of based on that premise. And so if you think about how a central bank can achieve that 2% inflation, it has to be seen by the public to have the ability to achieve that target. And there's, so it needs sort of two, two, it needs to worry about that problem in two directions. If you're above 2%, well, what tool do you have? As you said, you can raise interest rates. And if you raise interest rates, you will tighten financial conditions, you will slow down economic activity. And eventually, if you do enough of it, you even throw the economy into recession and you can squeeze inflation out of the system. But if you're fallen below uh, 2%, say you're slightly negative, then how do you, how do you convince um, the, the private sector to generate the econo economic activity uh, and, and to, to build up the sort of pressure in the labor market in particular um, to get back to 2%. Uh, it, it, it's sort of asymmetric. And the, I, I use the metaphor to try to get this point across um, of thinking about a horse. If, if, if you're riding a horse and the horse is galloping away and you have the, the reins and the stirrups, you can always pull the reins and the stirrups and slow the horse down um, to you know, a nice little gallop. But if you're trying to get a mule to sort of do a little bit of a trot. Um, you know, you can preach to it, <laughs> you can whip it on the, on the backside, but it may just refuse to move. So there's an inherent sort of asymmetry in, in the ability to generate the economic activity. Could you um, give, uh, sorry, the second question fairly short, but, but, please. But, yeah. but sorry, if I just finish off, finish off. But that doesn't mean, I would submit, that that, that doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, you just have to work much harder. And I think one of the lessons here is that um, if you're on the wrong side of the inflation target, uh, just relying on monetary policy to get you back to 2% may not be enough. That's why you may have to combine it with fiscal policy, because fiscal policy, particularly direct government spending, does inject demand directly into the economy. It doesn't rely on 
the private sector responding. So I think this has been the policy error that Japan has made over the years, um, and other economies have, have done similar. I think in those occasions, much more coordinated and aggressive, sustained monetary and fiscal policy is what's needed. Thank you. Uh, second question about the uh, labor shortage. Mm. Um, <clears throat> Well, uh, indeed, there is a labor shortage in specific industries, but overall, my strong feeling is that the, um, the, the labor pool is not properly um, divided. There is a, mo uh, a mobility problem, both in terms of um, the, the, the craft or the work you're doing. There is a geographical uh, problem. Uh, so, um, uh, but um, <coughs> at the base of that, why do, why do the salaries not go up despite the labor shortage? And they do go mm. up in certain mm. places, mm. yes. Um, so there is still a tremendous f um, free labor pool. Um, J Japan's, uh, well, um, unemployment uh, percentage is some, somewhere in the 3% range. But in fact, you have about 40% of the total population or the, the working population, which is only working at about 50 to 70% on part-time, on, on uh, contract uh, employees, etc. So these people uh, still represent um, from an overall point of view, at least 10%. So my internal um, figure is the employ unemployment rate in Japan is about 13%. Okay, we do need. To, I do need to get in an extra question. One question. So uh, please, so I'll have to cut. No, yeah. I have to cut you off there. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. But no, please. So please, no, mm. that's the end. So uh, very what, good. what is your comment okay, about well, that? Well, well, very, very briefly. Um, Yes, I mean, again, the unemployment rate uh, is not necessarily always a sufficient st statistic for the total, uh, the amount of slack in the labor market. So in the US, for example, um, economists, market watchers look at two measures in particular, the, the, the headline unemployment rate and another measure that takes into account what you just talked about. And that measure, even in the US, is much higher. So, so yes, you know, 2.8% uh, on an unemployment rate that never got above 5.5% um, is probably uh, not quite as tight as it looks. But I think the direction of travel is very much in the right direction. Um, and I think also the, the aging issue in Japan actually plays in the favor of eventually inflation coming back, even if you didn't have all the help from the Bank of Japan, um, in the sense that you're basically in a, a secular period where more and more people will be retiring dropping out of the workforce, but continuing to consume. So you'll have sort of fewer people producing, just as many people consuming, which kind of, again, leads you directionally uh, to tighter uh, labor market conditions. So you know, again, I don't think it, I, I, I would just be um, uh, kind of, uh, uh, or just observe that, that things are moving in the right direction. Um, it's still a long way to go, but uh, it is just very fascinating that literally now, I just, you know, all I seem to hear about at these conferences is labor shortage uh, and, and, and labor market tightness, um, which is very welcome news for the Bank of Japan. The other reason, of course, that's, that's, that's noted, and I think Governor Kuroda has made this point, is that, you know, in the organized, the so-called lifetime employment sector, um, wage settlements are not as responsive to short-term conditions in the labor market, because by definition, um, you've got long-term relationships. Um, and that's actually a card that Japan could have played more, is more, um, you know, using the spring bargaining process and whatever uh, to sort of coordinate uh, wage increases. I know the government has tried to, to rally the troops in that direction, but not too successfully so far. Can we take just one more? Sure. Okay. Okay. David, um, needless to say, sure. brief, please. I understand. Paul, in the dozen or more years we've known each other, eloquent as usual. Thank you very much. Thank David you. Satterwhite, uh, an associate member and member of the board uh, this year. Um, you spoke I think very clearly about the danger, uh, or at least the caution, uh, of uh, the Trump administration's um, 
uh, potential impact on the Fed in the, in the U.S. and and the politicization of the of the potential of that. Um, here in Japan, that was an issue. Uh, it's been an issue over the years, uh, and the current um, policies of, of Kuroda-san. Um, I tend to agree with you that he's done what's needed to be done and, and done uh, very, very um, effectively. Um, if you were to step back and, and the, say, the, the close coordination of policy between monetary and fiscal and including uh, Kuroda-san, what prescription or cautions might you have for Prime Minister Abe in the remaining years of his term to really move this economy to the next step. And we are comfortable here, but uh, there is the potential for more growth, in my uh, uh, opinion. Mm. Uh, and so I'm just keen to hear your prognosis mm. and, and uh, advice. Thank you. Oh, great. Well, that's a, that's a, a, great, uh, a great question to end on. Um, so just on the, you know, on the, on the coordination uh, front, again, I think that um, what J Japan is, is very interesting. And, in, you know, if you look at the last 20 years of macroeconomic policy making, talked about the Bank of Japan, for example, they've often actually been more of a front runner with policy innovation. And of course, the Bank of Japan famously pioneered quantitative easing. Um, they also pioneered credit easing. They pioneered forward guidance, um, etc. Um, and now they're pioneering this yield curve control and the overcommitment. So there's a lot of stuff. But they've also, um, you know, I think the government and the Bank of Japan have done some interesting things. The way that they revised the Bank of Japan law, for example, 1997 came into effect. 98 as a central bank watcher. I mean, I, I tell you, if you read the, I, I challenge you to read the Bank of Japan law and then read the Federal Reserve Act. And, you know, the Bank of Japan law will win the award for clarity, uh, you know, logical structure, uh, you know, hands down. So, and, and one of the cornerstones of, of that law is, and then you have the, you know, the, the, the economic, the, uh, Zaisei Shimonkaigi, Keizai Zaisei Shimonkaigi, Economic and Fiscal Policy Council, uh, and other mechanisms. You have the financial crisis uh, framework that was put in after the, the Japanese financial crisis, which is a permanent ability, gives the government a permanent ability, again, coordinating between the government and the Bank of Japan, to ha have TARP like capitalization of the banking system. So there's a lot of, so the coordination that I think has been institutionalized in the policy making framework in Japan, uh, by and large, I think is a good template for, for other countries and particularly maybe for the for the US. I'm, I'm all for that. Um, what could Mr. Abe do in the remaining years? Well, I guess we don't know how many years are remaining, um, but um, I guess one thing he could do is stay on for longer. That would keep Abenomics going. Um, but I think, again, apropos of the Bank of Japan, it is going to be very critical that the Bank of Japan, in particular, stick to its knitting. In other words, that we don't have another big policy shift driven by a change of governor. So the worst thing in the world, in my view, would be, of course, Governor Kuroda's term is up in April of next year. Um, some people uh, are speculating and hoping that maybe he might be prevailed upon to have a, you know, stay on for another couple of years to see this work through. Um, if that doesn't happen, then I think it's in really important that whoever is the new governor uh, of the Bank of Japan be seen very much, and the new deputy governors be seen very much as continuing with the current framework um, because uh, you know it, it a lot of it revolves around this commitment this very strong commitment and if you get a new governor that comes and says well you know what I have different ideas and I don't actually believe in all that stuff that's been going on for the last few years that would be kind of the worst thing in the world to do to destroy the credibility of the central bank in the eyes of the public. So trying to think very clearly about that continuity issue. Now that's all on the monetary side. At the end of the day, what really drives uh, stand standards of living, of course, is what's going on in the real economy. And that's where we come back to potential growth, um, you know, productivity, etc. cetera. But um, you know, I think one thing that Japan would, would be good to do, and one thing that, that Mr. Abe has never spent his political capital on, is bringing the immigration debate out of the taboo box and ha putting it on the table and having a, a sort of an adult conversation about uh, immigration. And again, it's not for me to tell the Japanese people or government what their immigration policy should be, but I think they should have one and they should recognize the 
what de facto immigration is already going on in this country, I would say largely to the country's benefit, but really think about what is the right way to to calibrate immigration, how much should you have, what kind of immigration, and not just say that's in the too hard to think about basket. Um, I don't think that actually um, uh, gives uh, sufficient credit to the um, intelligence and maturity of the Japanese people, who, if the politicians put the debate on the table, may be surprised um, by how, um, how much is actually embraced by the Japanese people. That would be my guess, but again, at the end of the day, it's up to the Japanese people to decide these things. Well, thank you very much. Um, informative and stimulating as ever. Um, please come back again soon. I'm sure oh, you, you will. Um, I'd like to give you a one-year honorary membership. Okay. You, these are beginning to run into each other now. Maybe we should give you a permanent membership. But I I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.